Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. This is the Let's Have a Real Conversation podcast featuring... And we're going to have a real conversation with Dashing D. <laughs> All right. And I... And JD. Oh, I don't get to do my intro anymore. Oh, sorry. Wow. Go for it. You see what happens when you get a co-host? They just be trying to, like, do your intro and everything. Yep. That's me. Mm-hmm. Trying to steal the show. What happened to equality? <laughs> <laughs> and I am JD, aka He Who Pods. So, nothing. Just watching the game, having a bud. I was like, what game? Where's your bud? Oh, that's your bud? Try. Oh, got it. All right. But you know. Mine's almost done. A little holiday chai. I zip right through my cookie butter cold brew. I mean, listen. It'd be gone so fast. I'd be like, oh, man, that's it? There's, there's none? You mean there's none left? Duncan got the flavors. That's a fact, Jack. You know, it's the holidays. It's holiday time. Holiday beverage time. Duncan, give us a call. Word. Give us a call. So it's, what's going on? Life. You watched any music videos lately? Which ones? That's what you want to start with right away? <laughs> <laughs> I'm okay with it. I just want to make sure. I mean, you know, why not? Right. Let's start there. Let's Let's just get right into it. There's some new music videos out. <laughs> yeah. And we saw one very specific one. <laughs> mm-hmm. We saw Cobra. Cobra. Meg the Stallion. Yep. You know. What did you think? <laughs> okay, so new okay, let's backtrack. New song, new video, Meg the Stallion. She executive produced this video. This is oh, her know. brainchild. So, and I know there's been a lot of stuff about Meg the Stallion and her management team. So I feel like this is, this is a, you know, she's kind of starting to pivot in terms of the way her business is handled. So naturally, I'm not surprised to see her um, getting more involved in her actual music and music videos and things, things like that. The, the, um, the, inner workings yes and the content i don't like calling it content but the work product that she is creating right so new video cobra cobra is the title of the song yep. um interesting video i would say yep um so tell me what you think what did you think about the song what did you think about the video i'll start with the video oh the video first okay um It fit the concept of the song. She's shedding her skin, which makes a lot of sense because Mm -hmm. the lyrics are very intimate, very vulnerable. Yeah. And so that makes sense. She's addressing a lot of the things that were said in the public over the last year, two years. Mm -hmm. And so that made a lot of sense. It was literal. It It was was a very literal interpretation of... Shedding skin. Yeah. Yeah, that was cool. I like that part. Yeah, that's um, a cool concept. There was like one part in the video that I didn't understand, but besides that... I know which part you're talking about. I saw your face when you watched it. It just was like, why we needed a close-up of her ass going up? I didn't, uh, ever, there, I didn't understand that. There was an ass clap that happened. But why? We had to zoom in on the ass clap? Well, I, I don't even care about the zoom in of the ass clap. I kind of feel like the ass clap, though, was a little strange considering the... The content of the song, the, the the context is probably the better word um, to use of the song. The song was very vulnerable and very uh, honest about some things that have been going on with her and how she's been feeling about everything that has gone on over the last several years. She talks about her parents. She talks about suffering from depression. Oh, yeah. That's in the hook. Catching a man cheating on her. Party next door. um, 
Hey, hey, hey. That's who it was. Don't misspeak about the party. That's who she was with? That's the wrong party. It wasn't, it wasn't Tori. It's not party next door, though. Who is it? Partisan Fontaine. Oh, shit. You see, look, I ain't even know. <laughs> I can't keep up. It's too many parties. Apparently. Too many I'm, parties. I'm like, what the party next door do? Oh, when I hear party, I think of party next door. No, party with a D. Party with a D I P A R D I. Partisan Fontaine is. You learn the, something new every day. I've heard his name, but I've never heard him referred to as party. When I hear party, it's always in reference to party next door. Yeah, so somewhere around the time that she started dealing with him, it became clear to me that that's his nickname, Party, P-A-R-D-I. So, yeah, when they when people refer to Meg Thee Stallion and Party, they're talking about Partisan Fontaine. See, I didn't even know. I just learned something new. Yeah. Yeah, so it was Party that she was talking Allegedly, about, cheating in the bed. Are saying. Yes, in the, in the bed where she sleeps. That's what she said. She spoke about that. She, you know, I feel like she kind of, you know, put it all on the table. And while it's in terms of like beat, it's kind of upbeat. And, you know, the video is she's dancing and things like that. But it's still kind of like a, I don't know if it's dark. I don't know. I don't want to use the word dark, but I think it's moody, I should say. Right. Mm -hmm. It was just weird. The ass clap was weird in the midst of all of that. I felt it was a little strange. I mean, and I guess it's her brand, but that's what I was going to say. I didn't care for it. I didn't need it. I I didn't I I mean, I thought the video was cool. I like I like that conceptually she really like did something rather than just dance around, you know, in a in a in front of a green screen and it didn't really matter. I kind of like that Meg Thee Stallion, whenever she's a part of a project, not necessarily her song, but whenever she's a part of a project, there's always like a video and it's always interesting and vibrant. And I feel like, you know, we we mentioned Hype Williams recently. I feel like the art of the music video was like a real thing at one time. And I know that people still try to create visuals no, they in don't. different ways. No, and, they don't. Not the same way, but I think people still try to do things that are, that have like a video component. It's just not the actual music video itself is not really, they, there's not a lot of thought or effort put into it. Maybe because we don't consume media the same way. So it's a lot of people aren't looking for the music videos these days. So it's kind of like why I put so much money. They put a lot of money years ago. They put a lot of money into these music videos. Um, and it was a big deal. We talked we talked about that recently, about how big of a deal it was for yeah. somebody to release a music video. Um, and to be big enough to have the budget to create a music video was a thing also. Yeah. I think now that it's so easy and it's so accessible to just throw something up in a video, I think people just don't really put a whole lot into it agreed um but i so i like that whenever she does something it looks like it, uh, any video that i've seen meg the stallion in in the last few years looked like money was spent yeah she's a top act yeah so and i i appreciate that so that was the only part where i was just like mm, yeah I okay understand. i think that um Say it again. It gave me pause, but that was it. I, I wasn't, I'm not mad at it. It was just. Me too. It is, it is on brand for Meg. Mm -hmm. um, I think that this was a good way of doing multiple things as an artist. Mm -hmm. She knows her fans. Right. She knows the sound that she has. Mm -hmm. um, and this still has that sound. Yeah. This is something a casual Meg fan like me or you who hears it in passing mm -hmm. and is not someone who knows her discography and knows all her music and knows all the intricate details of what she does lyrically. Mm -hmm. uh, a casual fan can hear this and still say, oh, this has a nice bounce and enjoy yeah. just the bounce. And I think today she knows that and she knows everyone is not listening for lyrics. Right. But... What I think is also cool is this was heavy lyrically. Yeah. Still was playful. You hear her kind of um, responding 
to certain things that were said on the trial, in the rumors, you know, all of these yeah. different places. And even in the hook, the hook says, this pussy depressed. And yes. so it was a really cool way, in my opinion, of kind of doing a layered mm -hmm. record, right? You got, yeah. you got the, the, the witty responses to the public speakings. Mm -hmm. You got the depression. You got the intricate, not intricate. You got the introspectiveness. Mm -hmm. You also got the bouncy record. Yeah. With the catchy hook, you know, it was a Meg record, but also it was lyrical. It was introspective. It was real rap. You know, it wasn't quote unquote bubble gum rap. I'm not saying that's what she always does, but I'm just saying that is sometimes what is um, sought out today. Today, yeah. lyrics do not reign supreme. And so right. to have such a lyrical record on a bounce, that's yeah. pretty nice. Uh, everyone also is not capable of doing that as an artist. Everyone cannot That's make true. the bouncy record that you might go dance to, you might go bop to, but also is some actually really deep, dope shit. Yeah. And maybe this is a little bit of my artist brain going too deep, but I think it's really cool that she was able to be this vulnerable and deliver it in such a witty way. Yeah. Even though she's talking about depression, being cheated on, the things going on in the public eye, this record doesn't sound sad and mopey. No, it doesn't. It doesn't sound like Eeyore is on the mic. No. It sounds like Meg, confident, bold, mm -hmm. big, is on the mic. Yeah. Her presence is definitely felt, like I said a while ago when we spoke about bongos and WAP. This was another moment like WAP, where you hear Meg and it's, <laughs> you hear Meg. Meg has arrived. Yeah, she did a great job, and and you're right. She she covered all the bases. She was able to do a lot of different things with one song, which you're right, it's not easy for everybody to do. Yeah. Um, I like the song. Me too. I like the song. I don't know if I listen to it again though. Oh, I would. I love the introspectiveness. No, I like the introspectiveness. I don't have a problem with the lyrics. I don't have a problem with the sound. I think it's a great song. I think the thing that gets me about Meg Thee Stallion's music is um, that thing she does in the middle of her raps. And she goes, ha! Oh. It drives me insane. I don't know why. It's just a sound I don't want to hear in my my. I tingle a little bit, not in a good way when I hear it. <laughs> like, I just, I'm like, ah, it's like nails on a chalkboard for me. I don't know why. And I think that's why I have a hard time with her music. Like, certain artists have tied themselves to an ad lib. And I think yeah. in the early 2000s, that got really popular. You have Jeezy. Yeah. yeah. I like that one, I gotta be honest. <laughs> but that's what I'm saying. So there are, you know, Fab for a long time had nice. Uh, Rick Ross has his signature. Oh, you know, Which someone say some some people would would say he stole. Correct, <laughs> and you know, people have their adlibs. We don't need to go down a whole list, but uh -huh. Hove also has his weird, uh huh, uh -huh. yeah, which is very weird everywhere. Actually. But he does it all the time. So, um, yeah, Nikki does something too, which is kind of similar to Meg's. Hat, but oh yeah, I don't listen to enough Nikki to know that. I don't listen to a lot of Nikki, but I've heard it, and now I'm trying to figure out what it is, and I can't put, I can't place the sound. Even but... early J Cole, me and one of my closest guy friends talk about this. J Cole had a sound effect that played on a lot of his records yeah. in these like middle spots where there was no words, and you would hear the <laughs> the sound effect. It was a lot in his early in his early music. You have a sound you do? I do not. Are you gonna are you gonna create one? Probably not. No. You should. No. You should like laugh or something. Oh, okay. I'll put that in my rapper notes. You should what should your sound be? I don't know. I gotta think about that. Contest. What should JD sound be? Somebody Tell us, please. Give him, give him a sound. You should have a sound too. What could your sound be like? And that's kind of like not that. 
I don't even know what that was, but definitely not that. <laughs> Mm-mm. Maybe it could be that. Mm-mm. <laughs> No, but yeah, that's my only gripe here is that I don't want to hear that. And it drives me crazy to hear it. And no, she's not the only person who has her own little, you know, stamp that they put on their music. It's a signature ad lib. That's what it is. It is. And I don't like all of them. Um, So I'm not singling her out, but I just, it drives me crazy And even listening to the song a second time, I was like, man, I would love this song so much more if I didn't have to hear that in the middle of it. It's a stamp. It's like an exclamation point at the end of a line. Yeah, I know. Jay-Z does it a lot on the song Run This Town. Almost every line he's got that. Yeah. Which he stole that one from Beanie Siegel. But that's another conversation. Oh, well, listen, the thievery that's going on in this episode already. A lot of theft. A lot of theft. So, I mean, I'm I'm happy for her. I'm I'm glad that we're listen for what it, for what it for what it's worth. It's probably not the right way to think about things, but you know, whenever someone someone who's musically talented goes through something in their life. You're going to get a good record. You always, you know, anticipate good music coming after that, especially if you know that they hone in on their their own lives to make their music, which most people do. Um, So I appreciate this. I I would say that I would listen to Meg Thee Stallion more if I heard more like this. So, um, you know. And I think, I don't know the name of the project, but there's a project she put out an EP a while ago, mm-hmm. and they say the EP is very different than her normal sound and is a lot more about her personal life. Okay, and she addresses a lot of different things like management and stuff like that. I don't know the name, but it came out maybe a year ago or so. Mm-hmm. Um, and I have heard that from multiple people. Uh, and piggybacking what you said, yes, the artist. When artists put their pain and their life in records, it often shines. Uh, Nas said, "They say the artist who truly, sh- they say the artist who truly suffers, his shit is the best." Yeah, <clears throat> which is, <laughs> which is kind of sick when you think about it. Just like, but that's what we want as consumers because we want to be able to relate to the music. Well, that and that's the what relatability I'm, is so heightened. I'm calling us sick. <laughs> that's what I'm yeah. saying. I'm saying like yeah, I'm the agreeing. the anticipating that like but that's what happens like when you listen to okay joe budden is not like a jay-z or nas level in fame as a as an mc yeah but people who liked joe budden's music Mm -hmm. they listened for that they listened for the depression the introspection the breakup records of course course. he even said on one song um they looking for hurt Joe. Hmm. That's what his fans grew to be grew to be accustomed to. Like they were just used to, oh, new Joe, okay, we're gonna hear about the breakup. New Joe, we're yeah. gonna hear about his battles with addiction. New Joe, we're gonna hear about all these different things. Mm-hmm. That was part of what he was tied to. Like, yeah. I know me, I get excited when I hear about R and B artists having a bad breakup because Absolutely. i'm like oh when the album come this out album about to be crazy when the album come out listen right you know they'd be in love and 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 you and know that's good i'm good happy time, for them good for them but th- them breakups though when you get the breakup albums breakup albums are great listen i, I get excited i know you know we don't we don't talk about him too much these days but and this is probably maybe we cut this out if you'll be, you'll let me know if we should cut this out. Chris, take note, Chris. Time but stamps. That album that came out after the, the Chris Brown and Rihanna. Oh yeah, that's the first one I thought about actually. That album was incredible. And I know people talk their shit about Chris Brown now and feel like his music is not where they would like it to be, and that's fine, but Back then, at that time, where we were, and when that was released, that was a great 
freaking album yeah. that came out at at after and, and rated R was too. and rated R yeah. was too. It was dark. I remember, Which, ra- right, I remember about rated that. R coming out, and I was like, "Is she okay?" Nah, nah. She was not okay, and I hated liking the album because nah, I mean, because I felt like so can someone needs to go check on her like. Truly, it was it was that type of album, but it was great. Yeah. But it was just like, and then and then what? Anti came out after that. Yeah, way after. But Anti was the next album, right? Wasn't it? I think there's one in between. Really? I think so. I thought it was Rated R and then Anti. No, nah, I think there's another one after that. Okay, but I mean, oh, actually, there's more than one after that. Really? Yeah, because then there's I'm a Chris Brown and Rihanna. Up. There's a Chris Brown and Rihanna record on the next album. Oh, okay. Well, I'm sure you're right. Or but... two albums later, actually. Um, it was rated R, an album I can't remember. Unapologetic, I think, is the next one. Maybe like the Chris yeah. Brown record, and then Anti was years later. I don't know why I'm grouping Anti closer, but yeah. So that was great. That was great. I, the reason I say it's thick, though, is because like we're benefiting from people's trauma, and it's something about that feels weird. But yes, it is absolutely a true statement that when these things happen, they go into the studio and they let that pain out. They put their feelings right into that music, and it is usually really good music that yeah. we get after that. So yeah, I'm. This is this is all true. Some more new music. More new music. Rhapsody released a new single. She did. She did. And it's produced by Hit Boy, which is interesting. Yeah. I'm wondering, and maybe I just got, you know, maybe my my hopes are too high. But I'm very curious, is this gonna be a Rhapsody Hit, Hit Boy, collab. Boy collab after the the run he just had with Nas? Right, yeah. I wouldn't be surprised. I think it would be really cool if Hit Boy became the conduit of taking conscious artists to the mainstream. I think that would be I great. think that would be really interesting because he definitely was able to accomplish that with Nas. Not that Nas is not mainstream, but mm-hmm. often that's one of the gripes that Nas does not make mainstream music in sound. Yeah. And the, we know that run definitely was. Uh, so I think it would be interesting to hear him do the same thing with Rhapsody. And maybe they already did. We'll see. Um, I didn't even know this single was coming out. I didn't see any announcements, any promo. And that makes me a little bit nervous for Rhapsody. uh, Because Rhapsody is a great artist. She knows... She's like... I think about Black Thought when I hear Rhapsody. Mm, The way she puts lyrics together. The way that she formats her, her... rhymes and rhyme schemes um you know it's it's hard hitting every time uh and i love it i think rhapsody is great uh she's definitely my favorite mc femc right now um not taking away from meg or anybody else but the way that those she's just great it's so. okay to have a favorite it's okay to have a favorite let's 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 normalize Saying that you like somebody more than you like other people. We do a lot of comparing between yeah. two people and all of that. How about we just normalize saying, okay, this person is my favorite. This is my favorite. For no other reason than they are my favorite. And I don't have to explain to you why they're better to me than anyone else. Because, I'm sorry, we've just gone through a week of things in the news about not being able to have a choice. And I... I'm sick of it. I got you. I'm sick of it. Yeah, Rhapsody's my favorite uh, lady rapper, fantasy, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and I like to see that she's working with Hit Boy, someone who knows how to get mainstream appeal, someone who knows how to mm-hmm. work with MCs and bring them to a place where they are more palatable for the mainstream mm-hmm. consumers. Um, yeah. So I thought that was really cool. I like the record. I like the record. Um, I don't think it was her best hook, but it was interesting. I like how she kind of poked fun at people. Yeah. Um, and she was talking her shit. She was talking her shit. I haven't listened to a lot of Rhapsody. Okay. Um, so 
I don't have a lot to compare it to. Okay. I liked it. I have listened to her before. I just don't, I, I don't have a whole lot of knowledge of her work. Um, but I feel like I need to, you know, do some digging, do some yeah. research on her because she's great. Um, and I thought the song was great. Um, I did. I do see, I just looked it up real quick. It looks like her album is complete. So okay. there's an album coming. Um, nice. It doesn't say... It doesn't say anything about uh, her working with Hit Boy for the whole project, but it does say um, that the album is done. And it says her close friend responded to an Instagram clip Mm -hmm. uh, of her in the studio saying the person's name is Darren Michelle. And um, they said, I just listened to your album again on the way home from the Badu concert. And I just need you to say that that shit is so special. It is like your heart on wax. And I just wanted you to know how special it is. So, I mean, I don't know who that person is, but. Cool. Great. I'm excited. I mean, her she last album was great. Don't know when, but when we hear about it, we'll tell you about it. Yeah. Her last album was really good. Yeah. So I'm excited to see what this. I guess it's technically her second album. Mm -hmm. I don't know how things are categorized anymore. It's weird. There's been mixtapes and things. Yeah. Yeah, She has multiple projects out, but I think technically her last project was her first project. No, she had a full length album Mm -hmm. uh, in like 2018 or 2019. Yeah, I've heard some of it. Um, It's really good, but I'm saying I, I don't know what they're categorizing the projects that were before that. Okay. So I'm not. I'm not sure. Okay. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I'm excited. I I would definitely check out the album when it comes out. Yeah. Same. For sure. So, well, the time has come. What time is that? We've got to talk about another lady in music. Who that? Missy Misdemeanor Elliott. Yes. Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Yep. Just the other day. Just the other day. Finally. Cause she's been around for forever <laughs> forever yeah so this is great i'm excited for missy oh me too and the culture because this is the first it says female rapper so i'm quoting the mm-hmm. headline and category mm-hmm. i don't like it but that's how they categorize yeah, that's it how they, yep and so missy is the first female rapper mm-hmm. to be inducted I almost said indicted we don't want missy to be indicted no <laughs> inducted into the rock and roll hall of fame Right. Um, and I think that's great. That's special. And, that's um, you know, I don't think we necessarily need the validation, mm-hmm. but I do appreciate that the rock and roll, rock and roll hall of fame is making a conscious effort to be more inclusive with hip hop. Yeah. Um, and so I, I mean, can't be mad that Missy's there. I mean, Missy is one of the legends of our culture. Missy yeah. has done so much for the culture, production, songwriting. It goes on. She should absolutely be celebrated. Yeah, absolutely. And did you see the performance? I did not see the performance. She did a really nice medley yeah. of a bunch of her hit records. Oh. And so, yeah, it was really cool. I know they usually, well, last year they put it on, was it HBO? It's actually a really boring ceremony. I will look for a performance to yeah. find the performance, but the ceremony itself is really long and really boring. Yeah. Neither here nor there. I just, you know, tried to watch it because I was like, oh, the Hall of Fame. Like, I would love to watch this and then no. But yeah, she's she's been such a great contribution to music and to the culture um, and to redefining, like, how we approach music. I think that... Um, People like Missy, she's such an innovator. Yeah. Um, And she did it like nobody else did it. Agreed. And she also set the tone. I I think about people like... um, Nikki. Nikki, and I'm skipping ahead a lot between Missy and, and, and her, but I think about people like Doja Cat. Doja Cat is... We always sit on this podcast and try to figure out where what lane Doja Cat is in, but the interesting thing about her is that she's not really in any lane she's kind of you know she kind of just does her own thing yeah but the reason i bring her up is because 
Missy was so eccentric in her fashion and just her style and the way she delivered her music. And I feel like, honestly, Doja Cat right now is probably that person who we would look to and say, wow, like she experiments with her looks and she experiments with her sound and she's not afraid to take risks. Um, I'm not, you know, I don't listen to a lot of her music, but that is something that really stands out to me about her is that, um, and I feel like Missy, Missy set the tone for acts like that. Um, so, gotcha. so I, I, I don't know if she credits Missy with, um, with influencing her in that way, but I see the influence, whether it's conscious or subconscious, I can definitely see that influence there. So, um, I think that Missy set trends. Absolutely. I think that Missy just, there's something really special about Missy and I'm glad that she's been getting her flowers while she's here. I know MTV honored her a couple years ago. Mm -hmm. Um, and I want to see more of that cause I just feel like she, listen, yeah. a lot of the girls that came after her, like she set the tone yeah. She set, for men too, it's yeah. not just women, but, um, yeah, I'm really excited that, that she's been, um, she's been acknowledged in this way. And I hope we continue to, to you know, I, I honestly, now that I think about it, I feel like I haven't seen Missy enough attached to Hip Hop 50. Hip Hop 50 is a whole nother thing. Which but, I, yeah. yeah, I'm tired of Hip Hop 50, but yeah. I love Hip Hop, right? And at the beginning of the year, Hip Hop 50 was a great thing. It was really exciting. We were seeing Hip Hop everywhere. And no disrespect to anybody, anybody at all. But I don't want to see Dougie Fresh again for another five years. I don't want to see. <laughs> I don't want to see LL for a while. <laughs> Hip Hop 50 became this. You know, when, when Hip Hop 50 started, while well, we're here, we might as well pull over for a second. When Hip Hop 50 started, you know, it was like, oh, do you remember that that speech? I don't remember what award show it was. Maybe it was the Grammys. Remember that speech where LL was like, we can ca catch everybody, but Hip Hip Hop 50 is a whole year of celebrations. It was the BT Awards. And we gh you know, we gonna make sure, it, no, it was before the BT Awards, because BT Awards was in June. This was like early in the oh, year, so, so this had to be yeah. Grammys. Yeah. And he was like, we are not gonna be able to catch everybody on this first go around, but it's fine because it's a whole year of celebrations. Y'all motherfuckers keep getting on the same ones, keep getting on the stage, and I am just, I am spent. Okay, and I love hip hop, and I was really excited about Hip Hop Fifty. But as we go into the final months of this year, I'm okay with not seeing anything about Hip Hop Fifty for the rest of the year. I'm good with it because, again, I just it's, it it became a lot to see the same performances over and over again. And I really wish that you know some people who maybe only performed once this year or didn't perform at all could be called and asked to do this Hip Hop Fifty celebration because. You might not want to say anything about it, but I know you know it's true. I know you know it's true. I don't know why I'm getting shot at. I was just letting you get your shit off. Somebody put Missy on a stage, okay? Somebody put Missy on a Hip Hop 50 stage. I'm sure she's done one, but, or maybe she hasn't. I don't know. I have to look it up, but I, ha I don't recall. I, I didn't see it. And if I didn't see it, that means she only did it once if she did it at all. Now, Dougie Fresh, on the other hand, been on that stage every single month for the past year. Also, just Dougie Fresh is just always there. D-Nice. D-Nice is everywhere Hip Hop 50 is. This is not a knock to either of those men. It's not a knock to LL. It's just that, hey, guys, y'all said that this was going to be a far-reaching, broad thing. And then you chose your 10 favorite people and peddled them to us the entire year. It's time to have a real conversation about Hip Hop 50.
and you may not want to have it. I left my co-host speechless and it's fine. We could move on from it. <laughs> it's fine. I'm just so fucking tired of Shit. Teach me how to Dougie. Teach me, teach me how to Dougie. I don't want to Dougie no more for the rest of the year. Got it. There have been a lot of them. And some of them have been trash. And some of them have been spectacular. That is true too. And I don't think there's anything wrong with... Wanting to see a more diverse performance. I leave it there. Politics as usual. Um, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> that's fine. I'll die on the hill by myself. Um, I just agreed with you. You did. Said- you did. But you, you got real political. You put on your suit and your tie. You put on your suit and your tie and you try to protect your political affiliation. <laughs> and that is fine. What that you want is me to fine do? because, you know, when it comes to the slander on the streaming services, I, I back out. You see? I back out. And so when I got to, I got to, I got to, listen. When it, when I'm, it, a, I'm a hip hop artist. I'm not just a podcaster. Listen, I understand. And so I have to be mindful about how I speak. I agree that some have been abysmal and others have been spectacular. And I agree, there's nothing wrong, or I shouldn't say I agree, I don't think there's anything wrong with wanting to see more people and not the same people. But I do think, if you wanna have a real conversation, I do think it's not so simple. I do think there are schedules, I do think there are beefs, I do think there are payment issues. I think there's a lot of different things that come with this and some of that has been said because LL, who you mentioned specifically, he has been in charge of curating a couple of these. And he has said, hey, some of the people we reached out to, we couldn't do it. And in the Grammys, they pressed him right after and he was like, okay, listen, some people we really wanted to be there, they said yes. But when they found out other people were gonna be there, they said, hey, if that person is going, I'm not going. Okay, so what are you supposed to do? I don't think that's the case with Missy. If we're being specific about Missy, I doubt Missy has beef with anybody to the point where she's not going. But then we got shit like what happened with Nicki the other day where Nicki was the whole Hip Hop 50 tribute. So... Which was ridiculous. Because Missy should have been there, especially because Missy has a good relationship with MTV, (sighs) as far as we know, anyway. Okay, but that's what I'm saying. I think there are a lot of other things, and that's why I was trying to be careful about how I responded, because I think there are a lot of other things that get in the way. Some are politics as usual. Others are personal beefs and even finances. Some of the people who want to come and perform, they ain't showing up for $5. There are people who have said straight up, hey, if it's for Hip Hop 50, I'm there for free. But everybody's not doing that. Why do you think you ain't see Jay-Z on none of these stages? I get it, but... I, By the way, I don't know where's the Jay-Z, Rock Nation, Hip Hop 50. Where the hell is that? I'm just saying. I don't know. He's busy sitting down with... Never mind. You see? Now I've thrown the politics completely out. You have. You have. Doing fluff pieces. Out in these streets. You gotta talk to Gail King about that. Listen. Listen. No, I don't think that has anything to do with Gail King. Doing a fluff piece? Yeah, I don't think that has anything to do with Gail King. And I think that has all to do with Jay-Z and... and if you say so. I just want to know how Gail King got all 13 uh, library cards at the exhibit. When I went both times, there was only one option. You <laughs> took it or you left it. <laughs> because she... Because she, she's Gail King. She's Gail King. Yo, that's some bullshit. She just had all 13 on this play and was like, well, they asked me that I want a library card. And when I said yes, they gave me 13. She, and there they are. She literally interviews very important people for a living. Plus, she's Oprah's best friend. You telling me you didn't? You don't think that she could have gotten 13 library cards? <laughs> yeah, 13 of the same one. 
They gave her all 13. She's not even a Brooklyn resident. <laughs> oh, wait, excuse me. You just had to be a New York resident. Sorry. <laughs> Bullshit. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Well, I only got one library card. So how about that? You only went one time. I ain't telling everybody my business. <laughs> I mean, that would be the reason you only got one. All right. <laughs> okay. Fine. Anyway. Yeah, so I'm really excited about Missy getting the Hall of Fame. <laughs> Yo, this is about to be a good pod right here. I just, I just, Leaving all that in. All that. Really excited about Missy. So thrilled yeah. about the Hall of Fame for yeah, her stuff. Absolutely. Love that for her. Yeah. Love that for her. You know who else is having a really good year? Who else? <laughs> Not Hip Hop 50. (laughs) (laughs) No. Who else is having a really good year? Actually, I don't want to go there yet because that's more of like movies. Let's, 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 let's get music done. We've had, we had a lot of music today. Um, Benny the Butcher. Let's talk about Benny the Butcher. You want to start with what he said about criticisms or you want to start with his new record? Yeah, because that's the shit that's pissing me off this week too. People with this criticism thing. Let's <laughs> let's, let's talk about the music and then we can talk about the critique thing because I think J. Cole said something similar to recently. He sure did. Uh, Benny the Butcher did a song with Lil Wayne. Mm-hmm. It's called Big Dog. And uh, they both showed up and did great things. Mm-hmm. You know, I... I'm very, uh, I'm, I'm very hard on Little Wayne. Yes, he showed up and he did his thing. I thought he did a great job. Mm-hmm. I was excited that he did a great job. Mm-hmm. I'm excited to see him with somebody like Benny the Butcher. Um, yeah. And what I was most excited about was Benny the Butcher did not have his. I don't want to say same, but he did not have his default flow. Yeah, um, Griselda is known for rapping on boom bap beats Mm -hmm. and having default deliveries yeah each person kind of has their default flow Mm -hmm. and we all do as mcs jay-z included we've heard him do a ton of flow since we were just talking about jay-z nas i mean every artist has a flow that you like oh this is their usual this is their favorite Mm -hmm. I think it's always nice when we hear them doing other things. Yes. This is the first time I, and let me just put an asterisk. I am not a huge Benny the Butcher fan. So maybe he has switched flows many times before. Okay. Every time I have heard Benny the Butcher, it's been a very specific cadence and flow. Mm -hmm. And he has changed that for this record. Mm -hmm. And so I thought it was really nice. It was a surprise to me. Mm -hmm to hear him completely different in a different pocket and a different flow. I said, Oh, this is good because he's yeah. lyrical and there's no doubt about that. Right. But it's kind of hard to going back to mainstream appeal, right? It's hard to garnish mainstream appeal when you're always putting out the same thing. There are a lot of artists who do that and have struggled to reach that mainstream appeal, whether they want to or not is a mm-hmm. different conversation. Right. But it's hard to be in the top category, in the Billboard number one categories. Mm-hmm. All of these, these, uh, all of these big lists, mm-hmm. all of these big accolades, right? The accolades. It's hard to get them when you kind of stay in one lane, right? Yeah, and so, true. like Rick Ross has a default flow. Mm-hmm. We don't always hear Rick Ross in those conversations, right? Right. Jada Kiss for a long time had that same thing. We don't always hear Jada Kiss in those conversations. Someone kind of in the middle of those two people is Wale. Wale is definitely slept on, but Wale gives us a lot of the same cadence delivery flow. And Wale. About to say, and and I like all of the artists I just brought up. Yeah. But these are some of the reasons why they have that struggle. Right. Because I, and I know I say this a lot, but I think it's true. Mm-hmm. Balance is key in music. Yeah. And if you're not balanced, look at what we just said about Meg. We love that the record is balanced. Cobra is a very balanced record. We love that. Well, it's hard to listen to somebody's full album 
when you're just getting jab, 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 jab. It's like, that's all you got. All you can do is jab. You ain't got no right hook. Right. You got no uppercut. You got nothing crazy in the tuck, nothing. And so- A roundhouse kick. I don't know if that's allowed in boxing, but yeah, right. <laughs> no round, I was going to say that. It's kind of funny. I was like, you know what, should I say something crazy? <laughs> but yeah, you know, if you go to see a boxing match and the whole time the person's just like, all right, all right, I'm ready. I'm ready and jab. All right, jab. And after three rounds of jab, you like, all right, man, you got something else back there? Right. Yeah. What's you ain't got nothing else in those shorts? Yeah. Nothing else? Trainer ain't teach you nothing else? And so, yeah. long way of saying, I was surprised in a good way mm -hmm. to see Benny the Butcher come out with a completely different flow, uh, you know, slightly different cadence. Mm -hmm. uh, this is super rap breakdown stuff. Sorry. But yeah, that's what I thought. It's a great record. Mm -hmm. And I know we're going to get to this next. Right. But I think this is one of the reasons why critiques should exist. Because maybe some of the people listening and watching to this podcast, hey, y'all. Hi. Hey. What up? What's up? How Maybe some doing? of the people. What's up? What's happening? I was wondering if he was about the TI. I was like, yeah. oh, is she about the TI? Mm -hmm. um, perhaps some of the people listening to and watching this podcast don't listen to Benny the Butcher, mm -hmm. but perhaps they do listen to Little Wayne or just appreciate <laughs> our musical taste and critiques. And right. so now maybe they will go listen to Benny the Butcher. Mm -hmm. No, we're not a number one podcast yet. And we're not going to have a million people go listen to Benny the Butcher yet. But if five more people go listen to the yeah. Benny the Butcher record, it's helpful to Benny the Butcher. Right. Which we'll get to that in a minute. But this is why I think critiques are important. And I appreciated the record. Mm -hmm. I appreciate uh, <laughs> I appreciate what Lil Wayne did, which made me laugh because the record's called Big Dog. Most of the verse, he has dog references and says dog mm -hmm. in Little Wayne's verse. And so that was cool, too. Okay. Did I got to listen it? to it. I did not hear it. Oh, man. I did All not right. hear it. So so we can't have a real conversation. We can't have a real conversation. But let's have a real conversation about the critique uh, thing. Because I, I can speak on I don't need to hear it to speak yeah. on that. So Benny the Butcher, <clears throat> uh, he was in an interview and, you know, Everyone knows what's been happening with Drake's criticism of Drake being criticized for all the dogs. There are multiple um, critiques that have gotten, I don't know, viral, but lots of views. Um, well, Drake, is Drake the, also the, has been responding to the criticisms. Well, I was just about to say, Drake is responsible for any critiques of him that went viral. Right. And so he's been responding. And so Benny was asked, what do you think about this? What do you think about people going on public 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 platforms? Can't get my L's out today. Too many wins. No L's. Just kidding. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, what do you think about people going on public platforms and critiquing artists? Benny says it's art and art is done for multiple reasons, I'm paraphrasing, but none of the reasons are for people to critique it. That people should not be critiquing music, people should not be critiquing art, they should consume it, enjoy it, and basically, he didn't use this term I'm about to say, but basically we should all shut the fuck up. Benny doesn't get out much, huh? I think Benny does get out, but I think Benny is one of the people who have had, who have had harsh criticisms and j cole says the opposite little yachty had j cole on his podcast which i'll be honest i did not know existed but i didn't either apparently little yachty it. has really been putting out podcast episodes like straight up putting yeah. out full-length podcast episodes consistently mm -hmm. and he had j cole on recently and j cole said he thinks the opposite he thinks critiques are important. He basically said there's an ecosystem and both sides help each other. The music Agree. helps feed the critiques. The critiques help feed the music for reasons like what I just said. People will say, hey, I heard on a podcast, people are loving Dash New Record, but I don't even know who Dash is. I'm gonna go listen to Dash New Record. Somebody who I mentioned earlier, who we're both fans of, Joe Budden, 
one of the things that has made hit his podcast huge for artists is their sleeper segment and right, yeah they have helped artists who people never heard of garnish a lot of popularity because they're saying hey here's a record you might have never heard before we're gonna talk about it we're gonna play it you should go check it out and that has been very helpful because joe budden is joe budden podcast is one of the number one podcasts yeah and so people doing stuff like that is helpful whether it's a sleeper segment or an album review or just a Yo, y'all heard this record? This shit is trash. Let me tell you why. Or the opposite. Yo, y'all heard this record? This shit is fire. Let me tell y'all why. I agree that. Oh, no, no, no. I just had a thought. Go ahead. I was just going to say, that's how music was disseminated before there was, like, the internet. It was, it was in magazines. It was. But not just magazines. It was, oh, you go to the record store and you hear something playing or you hear something on the radio and you're like, hey, did you hear this? Or, oh, you know, come come to my house at four o'clock because they're going to play this this track that I heard last night. They're going to play it again and it's really good. Or somebody's, <clears throat> excuse me, somebody's driving in their car and it comes on on the radio. Music was not disseminated the way it is now where everyone has the music at their fingertips. And a lot of the artists that we know, like the Jay-Z's, <clears throat> excuse me, Nas, um, a lot of the earlier artists, Run DMC, Slick Rick, all of the earlier ones, right? Like the music got out to people because of word of mouth in some way, shape or form. Maybe it was the radio, but it was still word of mouth because you still had to catch it. You still had to hear it. Right. Um, and then you would share it with friends or whoever. This... That doesn't happen without people having positive or negative opinions of the music. Yeah. It just doesn't. I don't understand. And I, I didn't mean to, you know, I know you were trying to make no, a point, cool. Cool. but I don't understand. And it's not just happening with music and we don't have to get into anything else, but it's not just happening with music. We are in a culture right now where if you have a negative opinion you are being policed for your negative opinion. There's a difference between being honest about something and saying, I don't like this and this is why versus saying, this is trash, this is shit, this is, you know what I mean? Like you could you could say some really terrible things, you could say some really mean things, or you could just say, hey, I didn't like it and this is why. The, instruments, the instrumentation on this didn't really, I didn't think it sounded right, or I didn't like the melody here, or lyrically, I just feel like this wasn't this person's strongest. I'm used to them doing something different. I don't like the sound of this. This is dance music, and I don't usually listen to dance music, so this is not really my cup of tea. It is okay to say things like that. It is okay to do that, and art is absolutely meant to be critiqued. It is absolutely meant to be critiqued. And that is why it is distributed to so many people. That's why it's so widely distributed because, or th this is why artists don't just make art and then keep it in a studio. They put it, <laughs> they have art shows, they put it in galleries. We go to museums to see art. We go to museums to see sculptures and, and paintings and, it doesn't make sense to me why people think just because you don't like something that somebody said about you that made you feel bad about yourself. And it's okay to feel that way. It's okay to have bad feelings about the negative things people said about you. That's human nature. But I don't understand this idea that people can't have an opinion. Right. That That's just, I'm not talking about when Funk Flex used to get on and be like, yo, this is whack. I'm not talking about that. Right. I mean, because because when you're talking about, and we had a long time ago, we sat in the closet and we had the gatekeepers conversation. And yes, yes, there have been times where certain people who were considered gatekeepers have done things like that. Yeah. And that hurts. That hurts the music. That hurts the flow. That hurts, that hurts the distribution of the music. Not today, but it did. Right. So that is why those people were considered gatekeepers. You don't even have that as an issue now. No. That is not even an issue. So it's so frustrating to hear. I get it. Like I, 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 I'm very sensitive. <laughs> the intro to my podcast is is Erica Badu saying, "I keep in mind that I'm an artist and I'm sensitive about my shit." 
I understand putting something out into the world and being afraid that the world won't like it. I, I feel like I'm the epitome of that. I'm always a little nervous when the podcast comes out or I'm always a little, you know, but I can't, if you're going to put it out there, if you're going to make it public, it's going to be subject to criticism and people's opinions, whether you want it to be that way or not. And music is one of the top things that is out there for other people's consumption. If you didn't want other people to consume your music and digest it in whatever way they interpret it, then you shouldn't have put it out to the public. Yeah. Uh, you hit it on the head. Music is one of many forms of art, right? And as you said, it is something that is on the top level, probably because hip hop culture is so popular. Mm -hmm. And also because as you said, it's readily available in our phones the moment it's released now, where before we had to do all the things you say, go to the record store, wait for Flex to play it on the radio, whatever, right? But I think he's looking at it the wrong way. I think it is something that is helpful to the artist. As Cole said, it is part of the ecosystem today. Today where there are not really magazines, mm -hmm. today where there are not really places that are quote unquote professional critics, mm -hmm. anybody with a mic and a camera is a critic, right? And so today the requirements of giving your opinion publicly are simply purchasing a camera and a mic or holding your phone up like a lot of people do. They'll hold their phone up right to their face. Hey, yeah, this is what I think. I just walked out of this movie, blah, blah, blah. Yep. And everybody can be Cisco and Ebert. That's right. <laughs> and we'll do that here just in a few minutes. Right. Um, and some, some would argue that Cisco and Ebert weren't always right, which is why differing opinions are valuable. Right. And I agree that I agree with that. And I think that when it comes to opinions, both the good and the bad can help your movement, your film, your art show, your live dance performance, whatever it is, because people say, oh, that's interesting that this is what such and such thinks. I'm going to go check it out. Whether that's a Picasso, whether that's something at the Philharmonic, or whether that's Benny the Butcher's new single. Mm -hmm. I think this is the wrong attitude of it shouldn't be critiqued. Anything you put out people are going to have an opinion because they are consuming it. It's no different than going to a restaurant. I'm sure when Benny the Butcher goes to a restaurant, he has thoughts on the meals that he has consumed. Now, does Benny the Butcher put on a camera and walk out and say, yo, I just left catch steak. She was all right, but it was undercooked slightly. I don't know because I don't follow him. But even if he did, that wouldn't be wrong. I don't no. think if that chef put out a meal, if a service was paid for, if something was consumed, people will have opinions. I don't Chad. think. Sorry. It's fine. Uh, I don't think we, we should be stifling opinions. I think we should be encouraging opinions. Now, I do think the way you express that opinion is important. Absolutely. I, I think your example of Funk Flex was on point. I hate to keep mentioning him, but at one point, Joe Budden was not giving his critiques in the best delivery for artists. There were many clips when he had the show with Ack, uh, Everyday Struggle, where he was saying, oh, this shit is trash. This shit is trash. This shit is trash. Yo, that's trash. And sometimes things are trash and you're, you're entitled to your opinion. But I do think the way we all deliver our opinions makes a difference. If you get on a public platform and say, yo, that shit fucking sucks. It's the worst painting I've ever seen. I don't know what Picasso was thinking when he did it. Yeah, that's not the nicest way to do it. That could be, could, can, possibly, we don't know. But it could possibly affect the sales of said item, the numbers of people going to listen to mm -hmm. or watch this piece of content, this creation, and yeah, the, the inside feelings of the person who created it. Mm -hmm. But I think one of the things you have to learn as an artist, especially in New York Underground, which is where Benny came from, is to have thick skin. Right. 
you will encounter people as an underground artist. And I know this firsthand who will straight up tell you to your face, yo, that shit was whack. Yo, that's not the shit you should have performed. Yo, why you didn't do this? Yo, why you didn't do that? N nigga, that shouldn't be the single. It should be track nine. All of these things mm -hmm. are part of being an artist. And I'm saying Picasso, Picasso probably didn't have to go through it in the same way. If Benny the Butcher had to go to an open mic every Tuesday and hear that every Tuesday until he got to a certain point and now those opinions changed, yeah, that's much harder than maybe Picasso who put out the one painting people didn't like or the five, whatever it was. He didn't have to hear that every Tuesday. And today you don't have to hear it as today you do have to hear it way more frequently because everyone's got a mic, everyone's got cameras, everyone's got opinions. And so you do, but that's part of the game. If you want to publicly put anything out, this podcast, a piece of art, whatever, if we decide, hey, we're going to do interpretive dance one time and put it out. If we do an interpretive dance piece, guess what? There are people who are going to see it and say, no, this is a terrible interpretive dance piece. I don't even know what they were interpreting. Well, then that's what, you know, that's what people are going to do. I'm not laughing at you because dance people could feel a way about what you're doing. And I don't dance, so I'm not going to laugh. I don't know if you're joking or not, but I'm you not laughing. You make any moves? I don't make any moves. Anyway, uh, yeah, I, I think that's an important thing to... to... So you're not going to dance with me? You're not going to do the interpretive dance with nah, me? No, I'd be, I'd, I'd be somewhere else when it's happening. Maybe I'd be with Chris behind the camera. But I don't you know. just said we were going to do interpretive dance. It was, it was if. Um, so... I think it's important that people understand... You need to have a sort of thick skin to be part of public anything. If we put out the example of the interpretive dance, people are going to have opinions whether they do dance or do not. You know people who do interpretive dance? I do know people who do interpretive dance. That's why you're worried about my, my dance I just did? No, I just think as a person who doesn't dance I'm, and a person who does a lot of other stuff, I already have enough criticism <laughs> that I open myself up to. I don't want to... I don't want to have any more scrutiny than need be. Oh. And perhaps that's really what Benny the Butcher feels. Maybe he feels like, yo, I don't want to hear more opinions than need be. But Benny the Butcher, you're a big artist. I know Benny the Butcher is not Lil Wayne or Jay-Z or Nas or J. Cole or any of the artists we constantly name. But Benny the Butcher has been on the rise for quite some time and he is becoming a household name. I feel like interpretive dancers are not watching this podcast. Yes, because that's the point we're making. <laughs> I'm sorry. All right, I'm out, man. This is... No, I'm just kidding. I'm not out. I feel like they're not watching this podcast. You think interpretive dancers are watching this podcast? We can, we can move on. It's okay. I'm just, I'm just asking. I don't know who watches this go. podcast. Okay. And so I'm just saying, if, you know. I mean, you said you know interpretive dancers, so I just figured, you know. I do. I don't know if they watch the pod though. I'm just, but it doesn't matter. This is in the web. It could anyone could come anyone across could it. Anyone could come across it. I just, and, yo, we could blow up and become the number one podcast, and people start going back to our old episodes and be like, "What the fuck is this? This shit is trash." And so I don't want to open myself up to dance critiques. I mean, I did ballet and tap for about a year. <laughs> right there, it is, folks. And listen, I've been going to weddings my whole life. <laughs> Got it. And I'll be on the dance floor. So I feel like I'm qualified. Since there's a lot of conversation about who's qualified to critique, I feel like I'm qualified to do interpretive dance. <laughs> Go for it. Knock yourself out. Yep. New segment coming soon. Dion interprets the dance. Not on this, <laughs> not on this platform. You're going to have to create your other... <laughs> Your own show for that. <laughs> Hardly dancing. There you go. Yep. That's a perfect name. Perfect name. Oh, hush. Perfect anyway. Name. I'm hardly dancing. That's oh, me. we know. That's me right there. We know you're hardly dancing. Anyway. We can move on. I agree with everything you said. I think that, well, I said what I well, said. Well, I was agreeing with you, so. Right. But I, I said what I said already. I just. We got we we got to get out of that space where you know, I, and I understand the fears. I truly do. 
But we got to get out of that space where we're telling people that they can't they can't dislike things publicly. I just I just don't under I don't understand that, and I don't think that um, it's helpful. Like you said, it's an ecosystem, and it doesn't it doesn't work if there aren't if there isn't space for criticism. Yeah, and it's um, always and it existed. Just, even in public, like in exactly. the 90s, which is, I don't know what the aim of Griselda was when they came out or the aim of them today as individuals or as a collective, but a lot of people say they have re-emerged. Mm -hmm. Is the right way to say it? That's the word, yeah. They breathed new life into the boom bap sound, mm -hmm. which is a 90s sound. Mm -hmm. In the 90s, the source was doing five mics or less you know five mics was the perfect score everyone aimed for it that was a public criticism mm -hmm. xxl had their rating system everybody had stuff like that it's just that today it's heightened along it's it's evolved along with the music consumption and the music availability and i i dare say the music industry it's but it's always existed yeah it's not, it's not that it doesn't. And museums too, like when a new exhibit comes, we did it here. We went and saw a book of Hove at the Brooklyn Public Library. We came here and we critiqued and spoke about the exhibit. It wasn't a song. We didn't go and listen to an album, even though you can listen to music there at the exhibit. We came and critiqued the uh, exhibit itself. And we also- And I'm sure people who go to museums and have podcasts, they critique what they see too. And we also don't come on here and bash people every every episode either. You know what I mean? And I, I think there's a happy medium, as I said before. I think there's a happy medium, or as you said, um, that there is a happy medium between, you know, being honest and, um, and saying things the right way or saying things a certain way so that it's With a not, level of discretion. Right. So that it's not mean or it's not rude or you know there's there's a way there's a way to share your opinion without um completely dismissing the work of another person i don't i don't think that i don't think that's helpful i don't think that's productive and i don't think that's what we do here and i don't think that's what a lot of because these days yeah it is a lot of popular podcasts or you know it's a lot of um platforms like digital people that are on digital platforms giving their opinions about music and i think we need that i think we you know how do how do you move the needle how do we move about culture if it's not fluid right so and listen sometimes being as blunt as possible sometimes shit just doesn't resonate with you it's okay to say yo i just didn't like this thing whether that's food whether that's art in an exhibit like <clears throat> hanging on a wall, whether that's yeah. a song, an album, a movie, whatever it is, it's okay to come up and say, yo, I didn't like this. It, you're, I think it becomes not okay when you personally attack the person who created it. If I came up here and said, hey, such and such artist is a complete piece of shit. Why, how come they can't write a fucking song? That is unnecessary. That is messed up. But if you say, hey, I listen to my favorite artist's new album and I think it sucks, that's okay to say. Mm -hmm. You can say, I, and you can even go, some people even do track by track breaks, that breakdowns. Yeah, track one, I like this. Track two, I like that. I just think you should include some of the good because especially th there's usually some good in anything, right? And I think that's the difference. Like I am very harsh critic of certain people, but I also come up here like I just did at the start of this conversation about Wayne. I'm not a big Wayne fan. I harshly critique quote unquote Little Wayne often. Same with Drake. But when they do good things, I also say that too. I think part of being an artist is understanding that everyone is not going to like everything. We came up here and spoke about Oppenheimer. <clears throat> Christopher Nolan is one of my favorite directors, but guess what? He also has stuff I don't like. It's okay to come up here and be like, yeah, I don't really know what he, what, why that war scene was in the movie Tenet. The movie Tenet was already weird enough. Adding that long war scene was unnecessary and really 
it messed up the film. That's okay to do even with your favorite people. Now I want to see this movie because I feel like it keeps coming up as like a bad Christopher Nolan film. Tenet? Yes. <laughs> Christopher Nolan is hard because he's done so many great things mm -hmm. and we have a high expectation of him. Mm -hmm. It's like all your all the top artists, right? Same thing with like going back to Drake. Drake fans have a really high expectation of Drake. Jay-Z fans have a really high expectation of Jay-Z. Mm -hmm. And so it's the same thing. Like if I sat here and did a track by track breakdown of Jay-Z's 444 album, it's not going to be great because I have high expectations of Hove and that album did not meet them. Right. And so that's what happens with Tenet. Tenet Christopher Nolan has a huge following as a director. Mm -hmm. He's done a lot of great things. I believe some of his projects have won Oscars, if I'm correct. Mm -hmm. But Tenet fell under that bar. And so people critique it. And what I'm saying is, that's okay. It's oh, okay for people to come up here and say, go on any platform and say, I don't like this thing. Yeah. I think the problem is that people receive that, internalize that, and get upset. If you're going to put out art, you have to be okay with the fact that one, everyone's not going to like it. And two, even your biggest fans will not love everything you do as an artist, as a podcaster, as an author, as an interviewer. I don't expect any person to love everything I've done in any of those categories. Mm -hmm. Even some of my biggest, biggest music fans, they come to me and say, you know, I like this project, but track seven, it wasn't my favorite one. And here's why. I always say the same thing. I appreciate your criticism and letting me know your thoughts, especially because you're one of my biggest fans, that person. Yeah. But I don't expect you to love every record. Mm -hmm. And sometimes as an artist, you also know, yo, this track is not for everybody. Right. Going all the way back to the beginning of this pod, and then I'll shut up. I'm sure that Meg knows Cobra is not going to be every Meg The Stallion fan's favorite record. I'm sure she knows that. Because this is not the usual single from Meg Thee Stallion. I'm sure she knew when she put it out, hey, some of my biggest fans are not going to love this record. That doesn't mean it's not a good record. Yeah. It doesn't mean Meg Thee Stallion sucks and shouldn't do music. No, she killed it. Yeah. But that's part of being an artist. I'm done. Well, that is true. That's very true. Um, I, you, you have to be prepared for whatever the reaction is going to be. Yeah. Um, everyone needs to be prepared, including Lauren Hill. Hmm. I didn't know that's where we was going. Almost, almost spit my water everywhere. Lauren Hill, Lauren Hill did, Lauren Hill right now is on tour. Let's start there. She is on tour. For the miseducation of Lauren Hill's 25th, 25th anniversary. Yep. She announced a couple months ago she was going to go on tour. Yep. Um, so she has begun that tour. Yep. Lauren Hill's been performing, I mean, in recent years at least, Lauren Hill has been performing pretty regularly. She definitely reemerged. Yes. Um, she was like Godzilla just coming out the water. <laughs> People like, what the hell is that? In, and then she came in hot with his 25th anniversary tour. And honestly, some people thought it wouldn't even happen. They thought she was blowing smoke. Um, she was at Roots Picnic earlier this year. So it was great to see her there. But yeah. Lauren Hill has been touring. Um, there's a lot of criticism around Lauren Hill's show and you know, whether it's good or not, I don't think we need to debate that here. What we do need to talk about, though, is the clip that's out. Is the clip that went viral. Where she today. says. Um, where she, <laughs> where she says, y'all lucky. Let well, me... that's not where she starts. You're going to play it? People, I can play it. Yeah, play it. Why I not? I can play it. Let the people hear it for themselves. People say, hey, yeah, she's late. She's late tonight. Yo, y'all lucky I make it on this blood rise stage every night.
when there was no support, when the album sold so many records, and no one showed up and said, hey, would you like to make another one? So I went around the world, and I played the same album over and over and over. I don't know why every time I hear her say we're because we are survivors, I hear Reba McIntyre saying, I'm a survivor. I don't know why. But I don't know why either. I don't know why. But I don't, I don't know a lot of things. So I'm assuming everyone could hear that, but if you could not, I will just recap, I will paraphrase. Lauren Hill is saying that people are lucky that she sh even shows up to these shows. Um, the people who say that she shows up late, they are lucky that she showed up at all. Um, she basically says that by the grace of God, she is, makes it to these shows. She also says that, you know, no one approached her about doing another album. And that is why she only has one and a possible. Um, she also said, so as a result, she's just been doing, performing the same album for the last 25 years. Um, and she's performing it over and over and over again, as she exclaimed. Um, there's a lot to unpack here. I want to, you know, point out that I did talk about her lateness on Hardly. So we don't have to harp on the, on the lateness. She said a lot here, though, that I think is relevant to what we do here on this podcast and it's not just about her being tardy so with that said i want to know what you think because i know what i i mean i i i know what i think but what do you think about that clip you just look right in the jd camp for a second do you think lauren lauren we love you we truly do but you know some bullshit is about to come when somebody starts with, you know we love you, right? <laughs> you know some bullshit is about to come. You you, you know what's not coming next? Love. <laughs> That's <laughs> actually actually I got I do have more love. Oh, you got more love. Okay. Do you think more and, love, more life? And we absolutely love the one album. In fact, my daughter loves the one album. Not only me transcending generations absolutely and um even just this year when we saw you at roots it was amazing regardless of how you feel about the new interpolations that's how you say the words yeah i think that's yep regardless how you feel about hearing it to different beats and it being delivered different ways the performance was spectacular i agree but Lauren, it's time for an intervention. <laughs> and I'm going to sit back and, and get away from the camera so we can have some a dash reaction in this part of the video. But I understand that back in the early 90s, mm -hmm. if what you say is true and no one wanted you to do another album, I don't believe that. But let's just say it's true. Mm -hmm. And no one wanted you to do another album. Well, Lauren, today is November 5th <laughs> of 2023. I'm going to say it again. Today, on the day we're recording this, it is November 5th. One, two, three, four, five, five, fifth, November 5th of 2023. And I'm sure that God that you're speaking about gave you the same capabilities to purchase a microphone, to get to a studio, and to reach out to some of your many industry friends to put another album together. So Lauren, we have a Blue Yeti right here, just in case you needed a recommendation. So Lauren, Please cut the bullshit. <laughs> Next. <laughs> oh, there's more. Oh, there's more. Okay. Do you think? 
I have no problem with people speaking from a religious or spiritual aspect, but I do have a problem with people trying to use those things as excuses. Totally agree. Totally agree. That's not how you hold yourself accountable. Just, and, and just say, you know what? Y'all niggas are right. I've been late. <laughs> like, like, or don't say anything at all. Don't acknowledge it at all. I wouldn't have said anything if I was her. I wouldn't have acknowledged the lateness. If you're going to continue to be late, you don't have to be an asshole about it. You could just be like, hey, whatever. They, I get there when I get there. People pay for my shows regardless. Or just say what everybody else says when they show up late. Mad artists show up late. They say, hey, y'all, I'm sorry I'm late. It was crazy, but I'm, I'm here to give y'all a hell of a show. I don't even think she needs to do that because I think people expect her I'm to just, be late. I'm just saying if you wanted to say something, that's like what a lot of people say. And we <laughs> didn't need to hear about your God or whatever you spiritually are connected to. I don't have a problem with people speaking about that, except in these type of instances. Mm -hmm. I'm here by the grace of God. No, <laughs> wait, do that again. I'm not doing it again. <laughs> but what, what was the what? what we, didn't, we didn't need that. We didn't need that. No, no you late, nigga. You're always late. <laughs> All right. It don't matter if it's five minutes or five hours. You be late. You be late. Don't be mad at people because you be late. You be late. <laughs> They paid their hard-earned money to come see you perform the one album. Wait, so pull, pull show up, up and pay. No, hold on. Let me get my shit off. Right, so shit show off, up then. and do your one album. If you're going to be late, then just be late and shut the fuck up. That's fine if you're That's late. True. That's your business. I'm sure in some way, shape, or form, being late has also affected your pockets. If you're mad that people keep mentioning you being late, then either A, stop being late, or B, shut the fuck up. Right, because you got to pay for that overage when you're late. And that's why I said, I'm sure in some way, shape, or form, it has affected her pockets. And people but have said that they've waited three hours for her. First that's of all, why I'm I not said waiting five minutes or five hours. three hours. If I've been there an hour and a half, two hours, and you still have not come out, I'm going home. I'm going home. And I'm going to take it up with Ticketmaster. I'm going, like, it's, what? That's crazy. But God... Don't got nothing to do with that shit. Do not use your spirituality, your beliefs for excuses. It is nonsense. And I'm glad you pronounce words properly. But I don't know what you being a survivor and a thriver <laughs> has to do with anything. In fact, that's what you should be thanking God for if we're gonna use God or spirituality in any sense, is that despite me only having one album, I'm somehow still able to do this. And that's what the praise and thanks should be for, in my humble opinion. Uh, yeah, I think this is stupid. Uh, you should watch what you say. It's not 94 anymore. People got camera phones now. I don't know if you got that memo, but people record shit and they post it on the internet and sometimes it catches fire. And that's why we're here now. Lauren, my advice is either show up or shut up. But you can't show up late and be saying dumb shit that doesn't make any sense. And listen, if you want to record more music, girl, go do it. Go do it. Plenty of ways to do that for the last 20 years. You said something that really, really struck me. And you said people pay their hard-earned money to go see Lauren Hill. And I... And, and and I think that that is a really important point here. She's not going around the country giving free concerts right. for her to be like, y'all are lucky I showed up. People pay, like, <laughs> somebody on Twitter was like, girl, this is your job. <laughs> and yeah, like, I think we forget sometimes because we we go to concerts or we go to sporting events as uh, entertainment for us. Right. But yes, the reason we pay to see these things happen is because these people are getting paid to show up and do the thing. So there, this is very transactional. Like yes. I paid my money. 
you said y'all said the show is starting at eight the show is going to be from eight to eleven and doors open at 7 30 okay well then i'm gonna be there so that i could see the show from eight to eleven i understand i would say i don't know i'd say seven out of ten concerts you go to are probably gonna start a little late that's fine i think everybody knows that i don't think anybody thinks that's strange but three hours two hours an hour and a half like when it's again at, you know, uh, a top venue, when it's at a, uh, when you've paid however many dollars you paid, like, it's just, it's not a good look. It's not a good look to make it, make it look like you are doing people a favor because you are not. No. You are not. People paid for this. Yes. And should get what they paid for. Yes. I don't, I, I'm having such a hard time with like everything that's going on recently. Where I just feel like you, you should be getting what you paid for. Yeah. It, 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 it doesn't make any sense to me. And I don't understand why the overlords, whoever they have deemed themselves, is, where do you get off? You have. You have not made an album in 25 years, but you got the nerve to get on stage. You remember when you said that that uh, May should be grateful? Lauren Hill should be grateful. I agree. And that is not to diminish the album. And that is not to diminish the fact that she just does get out there and she does do these shows and she has had to rearrange her music and all of that doesn't diminish any of that but you can't be obnoxious you can't be the person who says oh well y'all just gonna have to deal with it because i mean i'm here i made it i don't get that i don't get that you don't and i think people would accept that better from somebody else like name anybody beyonce beyonce just finished her tour i'm sure there's plenty of people who go to a Beyonce concert and, you know, maybe Beyonce's late. I've heard she's not usually late, but let's say Beyonce was late. I think people would be okay with that. I yes. think if she arrives 30 minutes late, even 45 minutes to an hour late, yeah. I think people would be like, you know what? She's going to show up. She's going to give me a good ass show. It's going to be the music that I heard on the album when I listened to it or on the albums when I listened to it. She's going to get up there. She's going to dance her ass off. She's going to sing her ass off. All of that. And, you know, when the tour is over, we might even get another album. Maybe. Maybe. But you can take a lot of that to the bank. Yes. That's what people were saying when Kanye had a phase of showing up very late. People were upset Kanye was showing up three hours late at one point, but they knew all of the things you said held true only problem with Kanye and we don't need to get too deep into it but my issue with Kanye was he would show up late and then he would like perform for a little bit and then go on a rant and nobody wanted the rant that right at the end that. of the show like we don't want this exactly because this is basically what that was correct um it's frustrating I don't like it I don't like it at all I, I just I just feel like and and I, I agree with you wholeheartedly go make another album then I don't know what the stipulations are but I would imagine 25 years later at this point she could she could literally just buy like a mic and some headphones and a laptop and record music in her house yeah. and put it on a streaming platform plenty of the quote-unquote SoundCloud artists are just doing exactly that yeah. Method Man is currently on a tear recording videos and recording freestyles to infamously famous beats and just putting it out. It's not an album, but it's out and people are going crazy. People are loving it, including myself. He's on a tear with these freestyles. I don't I don't see any type of anything from Miss Lauren Hill. And I think it's a good opportunity to create create new music now also because of the fact that she's been performing so much and because of the fact that some of the feedback is that people don't like the way that the music is being arranged. I think it's a perfect time to introduce some new music. I think people would appreciate the new music and she could do it her way. 
and we could actually hear the music performed in the way that she intended. I, I don't know. It's just a little frustrating, but I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Well, I think that's a good uh, segue to this next lady, and then this is this is our our, our transition from music to movies. And I know. Well, this one kind of is in both categories. It's in both categories. So the stage is yours. Well, because you know I don't got a lot for this one. Taylor Swift. Yeah. Not normally what we talk about. No, but there is a movie component. There is a movie component. This I... is a layered topic that includes both movies and music. And as we are a marriage of both at this podcast, it's kind of perfect. And I think that this, the, the, Lauren Hill is the perfect segue because Lauren Hill, uh, because Taylor Swift has experienced some of what Lauren Hill is dealing Very with. Very similar, yes. Not so... identical, but similar. <clears throat> exactly. So Taylor Swift cannot perform her music or rather, she can't. Taylor Swift does not have the rights to her music and the original albums that she recorded. <clears throat> so she decided to record Taylor's versions, which is super smart, if you ask me. Yep. And she's re recorded, she's been re recording her albums and re releasing them. Yep. So now she owns them. Yep. And <laughs> you know, making little tweaks and doing little things with it, and people are loving it. People are really excited. Nineteen eighty nine just came out, and, and it's out already. I thought it comes out soon. I think it just came out. Well, I think what I do know week. is it's expected to sell one point five million. Yeah, um, I'm pretty sure it came out this week. Okay, but uh, in in doing that, um, <clears throat> she's also recorded a lot. I just want to point out that Taylor Swift is. is her career is at this point is at 15 years. Okay. I feel like, I feel like I don't, I don't know. I don't know about anybody else, but I didn't realize, I guess, cause I wasn't paying it to, like, I wasn't keeping up with her career or anything like that, but she's been in the game for 15 years. So maybe even a little bit longer than that. Um, but I think her first album came out 15 years ago, if I'm not mistaken. So, the movie happened. The movie is the concert. I'm gonna say so. She went on her most recent tour. Right. Um, I got a little filmed. lost in my thoughts. I got you back, player. That's what that's what right. a co-host is supposed to do. <laughs> I got a little lost in my thoughts. Yes. So she's been re-releasing the music, and she's she had several albums that she recorded. I think she recorded two or three albums during lockdown alone. Um, and she said these are her words that. She had, I believe, five albums where she hadn't done tours for them oh, for one reason okay. or another. And she decided that she was going to do um, a show where she just, she was like, why don't I just combine it all into one tour? There you go. And she said, people were like, okay, well, what are you, what are you going to do? Perform for three and a half hours and, and just do all the albums and she was like yeah and i'm gonna call it the eras tour and so she that is literally what she's been doing she's been touring um i think she's on the european leg of her tour now but she did her u.s tour over the summer and she performed every single album she maybe didn't perform every single song from every album but each era is each era of Taylor Swift is included in in the concert. So basically, what she did was they filmed the LA concert, and that be, that's what's being shown in theaters. Or, oh, so or it's, was it's one shown. concert in full? It's one concert in ah, full. Okay. I imagine that they probably took bits and pieces from other shows, but it's the LA show. Okay. It's definitely the See, I, didn't know, I didn't know that. Yeah, it's her performing at SoFi Stadium. <clears throat> um, it is three hours. It's over three hours. In fact, they had to cut de- cut it down to get it into movie. Um, get it into the movies mm. um, because it was too long. So I think the movie version of it caps out somewhere around three hours and ten minutes. But her show is actually about three hours and thirty minutes long. Wow. Yeah. Well, they're getting their money's worth. They're getting their money's worth. Now we know why Ticketmaster broke. 
<laughs> exactly. They're getting their money's worth. I went to see it. Not the concert. Not the concert, but yeah. I went to see the movie okay. version of the concert. So here it's, is Dash review of, what's it called technically, the movie? Uh, Eras. That's what the movie's called, Eras? Yeah. Okay. So All I know is it says Taylor Swift in all capitals. Right. It's the, it's, <clears throat> it's the, it's the Eras tour. So... <laughs> It's all it's all concert. It's nothing else, and I don't think it could be because they have to cut it down. So it's it's not. I know Beyonce's movie concert is coming out soon, and December first, and we're you know anticipating that there's going to be like a lot of behind the scenes and things like that. Probably something similar to Homecoming. This was not that. Um, this was just the concert from start to finish. I knew more Taylor Swift music than I thought. Um, I sang along. Okay, so you were so you were Swifty. A little bit. A little, I'm a little Swift. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a little Swift. You know, I just I thought she did a great job. I really. I'm a little Swift, man. <laughs> <sighs> that was great. Listen, un, un, there are a lot of unpopular opinions. There are, excuse me, there are a lot of opinions about um, Taylor Swift. But we talking about the movie. We are. Oh, okay. Because a lot of those opinions are, are not around. They're they're around her, not the film. Right, but I think there's a there. I think that people say a lot of things that deter them from seeking out her music or and probably deterred them from seeing this right okay now she's not the best singer in the world and i don't mean that in a negative way i just mean no is she like my favorite singer or do i think her music is better than you know other artists no but i'm not here to compare her to anyone else i'm here to look at a, a, identify what I thought was interesting about what she did. I thought she was very engaging. Okay. She was really engaging. She interacted with the audience. I think the thing, the thing that's weird about Taylor Swift is she reads young. She's not that young. She's 33 years old, but she comes off a little teenager yes. to me. And I think that's, part of the thing that maybe uh, people don't like, but I actually thought that she was very engaging. I thought that she had great personality in her show. Okay. She interacted with the crowd really well. She told stories in between the songs. She's super talented. Like she was on the piano, playing the piano. She was playing her guitar. I was like, how, how do you, how? <laughs> yeah, I think she's played the guitar since she came out yeah because i remember very early footage of her just doing her thing yeah on the guitar now piano i've never seen her on a piano before she was playing the piano but i thought it was really funny she walked over to the piano at one point and she was t telling the story this is when she started talking about how she decided to do the heiress tour and she goes towards the piano and she kind of she puts her arm up and she leans she leans forward and she's like talking to <laughs> the thousands of people in the audience and then she goes what <laughs> she's like what am i doing it's like she oh she got caught in the moment it's like she got caught up in the moment and forgot that she was and forgot that she was on stage with thousands of <laughs> with, pe with thousands of people in the audience that's cool and that made me i, I thought that was so endearing um, and I didn't, it didn't look fake or staged or anything. It looked like she genuinely was just comfortable with um, being there and, you know, talking to the audience and all of that. And I, I really appreciated that. I think if you can engage people, you, you've you got it, right? Yeah. Um, the performances were great. The, I thought the music, she sang the music well. She performed the music well um, for what it is. Like, I'm not, like I said, the music, if you... Tell me, you know, deserted island, and you can only take three. I was about to say CDs. You can only, you can only have three artists yeah. that you take. I'm probably not taking Taylor Swift, but to go and like, I would have seen that show live if someone gave me tickets. 
I would have seen that show live. I wouldn't have hesitated. I would have gone to see that show live. If somebody told me next year, oh, I've got these Taylor Swift tickets. Do you want to go? I would go because I thought it was great. I think that she gave what she sells. I don't, I, I don't think she, you know, I don't think she reinvented the wheel, but I think she, she gave what, what Taylor Swift gives. Got you. And I, I was I was okay with that. I was I was into that. And and the 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 young lady that I took, your niece. Yes, she had a she had a blast. She she was, I mean, she likes Taylor Swift currently. Like she's she's into Taylor Swift. So she was, she was excited. We were singing the songs, and you know, we were having a good little time. So you know, that's great. Yeah. And so as a film, mm-hmm. you feel it was long. Yep. I had to you know bathroom break. Okay. That's important. Um, yes, it is. <laughs> that's important. I thought it was super long, but I didn't think it was long to the point where I was like, oh, gosh, uh, how much more time do we have? Okay, that's good. I didn't feel like that. Um, and maybe it was the bathroom break that broke it up for me. But um, in fact, my niece said to me at one point, she goes, I have to use the bathroom. And I was like, can we wait until this air is over? <laughs> because it was one that I was very familiar with. So I was like, can we? But then a song came on that I did not know and it was super long. So we just, we went to the bathroom during that song. But yeah, I was like, can we, not this era. Cause I don't know the newer eras, but I know the older ones. Gotcha. So I thought it was good. It was a nice little sing along. There you go. <laughs> Nothing yeah. wrong with that. Yeah. So I, I know you said you didn't care for this uh, off pod. You said you didn't care for this style of movie or whatever. It's not really a movie. In fact, AMC, when um, when it was starting, they didn't say, normally they say enjoy the movie. They say enjoy the concert. Oh, that's so, interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I don't listen to Taylor Swift. Mm-hmm. I mean, I might know three songs because they were played on the radio so much. Yeah. But that's probably it. Uh And so when it was just about the music, I didn't think that fit here. Yeah. But once we start talking about a film, Mm -hmm. and by the way, something you did not mention is that film has done exceptionally well in the box office. It has. And so that's something we do talk about here. We talk about films that are doing well, films that we've Mm -hmm. seen, and also that re-release of 1989 and the huge numbers they're saying it's gonna sell or did sell i don't know what it sold i know the projections were what what i brought to you and said oh we should probably discuss it right uh as well because now it is also not only the film but this music and re-releasing music is popular Mm -hmm. but largely people's re-releases have not done well they kind of either fly under the radar or they're announced but people will say like ah this is not as good as the original I even feel that way about some of the artists I like that are older and have re-released songs. Mm-hmm. I feel like, yeah, the re-release, not really the same. Cadence was different. Maybe you're a little older. Your voice doesn't sound the same. You can't hit the notes, whatever. But I think that, yeah, it became a topic that was too large for us to ignore. The mm-hmm. film is doing very well in theaters. 1989 was said to, to be projected to sell 1.5 million. Listen, it doesn't matter who you are. Yeah. Projections for album sales are down. Yeah, absolutely. You're not hearing those numbers today in most genres. And so it became this multi layered conversation that I felt, yeah, you saw the movie, you yeah. can critique the movie, you can give us your movie review. And then there are other parts of what we talk about here that are part of the conversation now. And I just, I think, I think what's really interesting too is her level of output. Yeah. Um, Cause not, again, not only is she, she releasing Taylor's versions, but when she said she recorded two to three albums during lockdown, which for celebrities, lockdown was pretty short, but yeah, there's like two or three albums that she performed uh-huh. that... She was like, yeah, I just wrote these, you know, there was not much else to do. So I, I was just 
writing yeah. and 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 that's that and she writes her own music so that's that's a thing too one of the albums is from it's like she wrote it she said it's not real like she wrote wrote it like it was a story i forget which album i think it's called folklore actually and she wrote it like it's a story about different characters she said she just created these characters gotcha. and wrote about them and that's that album which i just i thought that was really interesting um and yeah her the volume in terms of how many people her music reaches crazy i would just think that's wild i don't see how much she sold but i do see okay The album in 1989 that was released a week ago <laughs> was the biggest, it was the biggest streaming day for an album in 2023 on Spotify and of all time in Amazon Music. There you go. So in the US, it logged the biggest sales week of Swift's career, her 13th number one on the Billboard 200. Um, Her record, it says, I'm just going to read this. Her record extending sixth album to sell over 1 million first week copies Mm. and the highest vinyl sales week of the 21st century, becoming the best selling album of 2023. Wow. It topped the charts in 14 territories globally. That's wild. Listen, somebody likes it is all I got to say. A lot of somebodies. Yeah. Because... The reason why I'm I'm speaking that way is because, and we don't have to get into it, but I think in terms of when we're talking about the culture, and we're not talking about Taylor Swift when we're talking about the culture, but when we're talking about the culture, there is a dis there is a disconnect. Like I feel like when when we talk about the culture, there's certain artists outside of the culture that we widely respect and. Um, you know, will collaborate with or just, you know, maybe sample their music or what, whatever it is, right? Taylor Swift is not one of those people. No. I feel like the culture does not care for her in a, in, a, in a widespread way. Maybe there are people who have an interest, but I feel like for the most part, it's not like, she's not one that, you know, we kind of take under our wing or, you know, what because she's not really, she's not really of the culture. So, right. But there, but I I feel like she did have the one Apple commercial where she's on the treadmill bumping was a Drake and future. But I mean, that's about it. We don't, we don't see her dating our, our men, quote unquote, I guess is the way to say it. We don't see her at the parties. We don't see her. We don't even see her do like Adele where Adele, we always see the, Different videos of Adele going crazy when Monster's on or well, doing is... Nicki Minaj's part all animated for Monster. Well, Adele is Jamaican. Yeah. So. As well as Celine Dion. But she's outside of the culture. <laughs> Just joking. Goofball. <laughs> you remember when Adele had them braids with the dreadlocks? I don't know. I don't actually. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know anything about that. I'm gonna find a picture for you. Okay. You gotta put, you gotta throw that up. Yeah, you gotta throw that up when you do the Chris, pod. I'm gonna find it, Chris. I'm gonna find it. If she finds it, add it in. This is this is kind. This is amazing though, in terms of of her reach and breaking records. I mean, yeah, of course. This is it's it's interesting to see. Um, but yeah, that's. All I got there, you know, not our normal brand of content, but no, but really, it, really but it is because of the film, right? I I think because of the film and the whole re-release thing, it it became fitting for our pod, yeah. Because we come up here and we do movie releases and we speak about music industry happenings, yeah. And this is both of those. This is true. Well, let's move on because you know, that's yes, you've been swift long enough. <laughs> A little swift. Oh. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so, Dash, aka 
Dash, a.k.a. Lil Swift. <laughs> <laughs> That's the merch, Lil Swift. <laughs> Yo, uh, Lil Swift being our first merch would be crazy. <laughs> that would be crazy as, uh, if Lil Swift was our first our first piece of merch. That would be wild. That would be wild. You in a blonde wig, Lil Swift? <laughs> what? No, I'm never wearing a blonde wig. No, no, no. That would be great. Mm-mm. How about blonde braids? Would you do blonde braids and be Lil Swift? Oh, you thinking about they gotta it? They got to be, they got to have like a brown hue. It can't be fully, like I, I'm not going to be like platinum blonde. You got to be like a honey blonde or something like that. And even then, I don't, I'm not really a blonde braids girl, but it's fine, you know. You I know, got do, you. do do your thing. If that's if that's your thing, that's your thing. I mean, I'm sure Chris could edit your hair blonde, you know. No, he will not. <laughs> <laughs> you see, Chris, she never want to have fun. Let's make that clear right now. Chris is not making my Chris. You have blonde. all right, Chris. I give you permission to take my hair and turn it blonde if you need to. Don't worry about it, Chris Brown style. Don't worry. That was not a good look on him. And it won't be a good look on you. I'm just saying, if it's for merch, he could do it. He could do it. Anyway, let's <laughs> let's let's move on. Let's move on, okay? Let's move on to some scandal. We don't talk about scandal on this podcast. Oh well, yes we do. Oh man, all right. Yes we do. I mean, since we're talking about white people, we might as well talk we about yeah, more whites on the pod. Alec Bald Alec Baldwin. Oh. <laughs> Yes, yes, he is a white we talk about, yeah. Yeah. Well, there's not much to say, but new evidence has been presented. And so the New Mexico attorneys are going to be recharging. Alex Baldwin is in trouble again. Same crime, new evidence. And it's going to go to a grand jury to see is it worth taking to a trial the prosecutor of New Mexico says they feel there should be a new trial. And so the next step is to recharge him and put it in front of a grand jury. You want to remind people what they're charging him for? The involuntary manslaughter is the charge. He killed someone during a film shooting Allegedly. and injured. Well, someone died. Okay. Was it on purpose or not is what we're trying to figure out mm-hmm. through this process. Okay. But he killed the person. Sometimes sure. people die by accident, but someone died. Right. And so a person was, two people were injured. One was fatally, both at the hands of Alec Baldwin. The trial is to figure out, or the charges are to figure out, is he, as the Routers article I read says, is he criminally culpable for the incident? Dumbed down. Did he kill her on purpose? Did he mess with the weapon? Is he supposed to go to jail for a crime? That's what this is about. Right. And so they previously charged, they previously arrested him and dismissed the case because of the evidence that his party says they did not tamper with the weapon and it was not uh, a weapon that could actually fire. Uh, which I thought was weird, but whatever. And now the new evidence says otherwise through forensic testing. And that's what we're, that's what is going to be discussed and examined to see is the evidence overwhelming enough to be taken to trial. But there should be a grand jury hearing in this month of November. Really interesting. And you're right. There's not a whole lot to say here. I think we just got kind of got to see uh, how this plays out. Um, yeah, I don't have a whole lot to say about it. It's it's a really unfortunate thing that happened, and you know, um, also unfortunate. Jonathan Majors. And, What's unfortunate and about his, him and his legal troubles? Oh, okay. Yeah. You know, he's he's been in and out of court the last few months um, after the incident he had with his former girlfriend. It, it was his then girlfriend at the, t- well, yeah. Whoa, hello, we don't even know. We're not sure. We don't even know. 
We're not sure. Um, but yeah, so uh, there's some updates there. There are updates. What are the updates? Well, they were going to, uh, I guess they were considering pressing charges against uh, the the ex-girlfriend um, for her part in uh, the altercation that happened between the two of them. Yep. Um, where she got physical with him. Right. Um, they later decided to throw it out. Um, so she will not be charged. Um, one of the arguments um, from Jonathan Major's uh, legal team was that she was uh, the aggressor um, in the situation that happened between the two of them. But that seems to have been thrown out by the other side. So, um, yeah. And I think they 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 go back to court this month. Yes. So the news cycle was buzzing all over the place. All these different publications were putting out that the ex-girlfriend was locked up. She was going to be on trial, blah, blah, blah. Most of the headlines said Jonathan Major's ex-girlfriend, insert name, because I don't remember it, insert name was uh, arrested for the same incident. And so a lot of people just read that headline and assumed exactly what you just said. She was the aggressor. She was going to be put on trial. She's going to jail. Not the case. She turned herself into Manhattan District Attorney offices. And Manhattan District Attorneys decided way a, a long time ago that they were not going to press charges. And so it was just a... What's the word I'm using here? Uh... When you have to do something, but it's really not... Formality? Yes, thank you. It was just a formality. Because of the way everything went, they had to at least bring her in and process her. Mm -hmm. And it was all dismissed and dropped immediately. There is no... They said... I'm not saying... Manhattan District Attorney said there is no evidence to even put a charge of any kind towards her. And so everything is done. It's over. She's finished. Uh, with the legal process against her. There is no legal process against her. Mm -hmm. What is happening is they had to get through with that to get back to the Jonathan Major situation. And Jonathan Major's situation continues later this month. His trial starts later this month. Yeah. Yeah, so I guess we'll see how all of this plays out. This has been going on for quite a while. So it's... You know, we just kind of have to wait and see what happens. Um, but with that, uh, he, his name has also been buzzing in the uh, Disney slash Marvel, um, I was going to say universe, but it feels weird to use the word universe in that way when you're talking about something with Marvel. His, his, so, his role in Marvel. Right. And the Marvel universe is... The multiverse you will um so yeah there's been some updates about his role and that <laughs> are seemingly were connected to what his legal troubles but it it appears to not be that not actually be true yeah um so yeah yeah there's been got? there's been some what i like to call media manipulation mm -hmm. variety and other places took a small piece of a Marvel announcement, I guess you can call it, and kind of use that as a headline where, oh, Jonathan Majors is getting kicked out of Marvel because of his legal troubles. That's not what's going on. So uh, I'm going to give the quick version. If you guys want the longer version, you can go to YouTube and look up Emergency Awesome. He's awesome, pun intended. And he breaks this down in lots of details. The quick version is... Jonathan Majors is Kang the Conqueror. That's not changing. Kang the Conqueror's role in the grand scheme of things is changing. And those discussions started when Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania did not do well in theaters. Mm -hmm. And so because Marvel saw lower numbers than expected, they felt perhaps audiences are not as connected with Kang the Conqueror as a character as they intended and anticipated. So they are considering 
and more than likely will be reducing Kang the Conqueror's role after the Kang Dynasty film. So the idea before was just like Thanos was part of multiple big films or actually multiple Avengers films as a big role. That was supposed to be kind of the template used for Kang the Conqueror. And so that's why you see Kang being used and different variants of Kang being used throughout Marvel's uh, Phase 4, Phase 5, and Phase 6. However, at the culmination of Phase 6, it's supposed to be two or three movies where there's two or three Avengers movies that are tied together, Kang Dynasty, and then Secret Wars. Mm -hmm. And so the changes that they're discussing and kind of announcing are before it was supposed to be kind of how Infinity Wars was the first full Thanos movie. And then we saw him again in uh, Endgame, Avengers Endgame. You would have saw Kang the Conqueror in the Kang Dynasty film. And then whatever Kane or Kang or Kangs remained, because it's supposed to be a huge war, whoever survived was supposed to come to the Avengers 6 and 7. However, they're naming the films. I don't know, but... It's supposed to be Kang Dy- the Kang Dynasty. The surviving Kangs from there would come to the Secret Wars film or films because there are now rumors that Secret Wars will not just be one movie, but it will be two movies. And so that villain was supposed to still come to be the end and the closing of the multiverse saga, just like Thanos in the Infinity Saga and those two bookend films, if you will. Now they're saying that's going to change You will not see Kang as the big villain after that film. Those next one or two Avengers films Mm -hmm. that close out Phase 6 will be a different villain. They will be Doctor Doom. And so the way we saw Thanos slowly being weaved into the Infinity Saga films, that's what we're going to start seeing in Phase 5 with Doctor Doom. And they're going to take events from phase four and phase five and kind of say, hey, this stuff that was happening behind the scenes, there was this other guy you didn't know about. That guy is Dr. Doom, and he will slowly become a bigger villain than Kang the Conqueror. So this has nothing to do with... And they said... It has nothing. They problem. said all of this started, all of these plans and discussions began when Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantum Mania did not do well in like January or February, whenever it was that it came out. And that also speaks to Marvel pushing back so many of its release dates. That and the actor strike. Well, yes, the the strike. And before the writer's strike. The strike played into that too. But this, um, but the Marvel multiverse and that entire world is uh, the the films and the shows that are coming out are like, a lot of them are distant, meaning Secret Wars that you're talking about is not supposed to come out until 2027. So this is a long-term plan yeah. um, that Marvel has. Uh, so it, it makes sense that there would be, have to be some modifications midway to try to make sure that, I mean, I'm sure they put in, a lot of money and a lot of time and a lot of effort into this multi-year plan. So um, it would make sense that midway they'd have to make some changes to make sure that it was all worth it. Yeah, especially when it's not going well. Phase right. four was not well received. Yeah, And phase five so far has not been that great either. So it makes sense that, okay, we're approaching the halfway mark of this next saga right cats are not really connected with it and seeking yeah. it out maybe it's time to make some changes yeah. that makes sense that's it, it makes perfect sense yeah um well <laughs> speaking of disney oh comcast hulu hulu well it's all it's all one and the same that's true um, even though it won't be soon So Disney was previously the majority shareholder of Hulu. Um, The remaining 33% was owned by Comcast. Um, But that is changing. 
that is changing. In fact, it's interesting because Disney first came in as a minority owner of Hulu, but made it very clear, we want more of Hulu. Yeah. And so, yeah, it's now announced that Disney will be purchasing yeah. the remaining third of Hulu from Comcast. It's, and yeah, I said it wrong. No, you don't. Oh, yeah. And so another huge entity that Disney is purchasing. I think it's really interesting because when Hulu started, Hulu was a joint venture between um, all of the broadcast networks. Um, and it was a way for them to kind of take away that um, monopoly of the streaming services. Um, and we've slowly seen streaming change directions. When Hulu started, there wasn't a Peacock and there wasn't a Paramount Plus. No. And they were all putting their content into this one place. And most of it was really have... like Fox. Yeah. A lot of stuff I saw ads for was like Fox or SF, FX, FX. Yeah, which... But now Disney owns it. Disney owns FX. But yeah, in the in the beginning, it was all of them. You could find content from all of the the the, the major networks: NBC, ABC, those, um, all of those broadcast TV networks. networks. Yeah, and slowly over time, it became clear that you know if you really want a position in in the the TV landscape as it is now, as it exists now you've got to be a major player in the streaming game and you know or at least dip your toes well they did dip their toes that was hulu was i feel like hulu was them dipping their toes until they realized that well there's a lot of money to be had and then acquisitions and then you've got netflix on the side at that point that was um well when hulu first started netflix was the streaming platform it was but but Netflix had a slow rise. I don't know if you remember, a lot of Netflix streaming in the beginning wasn't that great. Um, they didn't have the best acquisitions. And then when Hulu came on the scene, it really was a, a thing because a lot of, uh, uh, like I said, a lot of the broadcast programming was landing on Hulu, not on Netflix. Yeah. And I think that's why Netflix really had to look at their programming and beef up original programming so that they could contend with the networks that were already creating original programming. Yeah. Um, and who, so, so Hulu was kind of like a springboard for the networks to say, okay, how do we, how do we get our, get the lion's share of, of, of what's out there? Um, and Disney just, <laughs> Disney said, I'm going to eat, <laughs> we're going to eat all of this up. I mean, that's what Holy Disney has been kids. doing for, uh, for many quite years. some time now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and like 08, 09 is when, I don't know about everybody else, but 08, 09 is really when I was like, yo, Disney's buying everything. Yeah. They, and since then they've really bought everything. Oh, right. I mean, with the acquisition of Pixar and all of the other things that they've acquired over the years, all of the other companies they've acquired over the years. Yeah. And that's not to count out. They've been playing real life Monopoly right in front they, of our eyes. They have. And that's, and that's not to count out NBC Universal or, um, or Paramount. I think that they all have their own corner of the market. I think when it comes to television and even uh, di di the, the unique thing about Disney is that Disney has it all. Like Disney has the movies, Disney has the children's programming, Disney has the sports. I mean, ESPN is huge. I don't think anybody else could be as big as that, right? right? Um, but, you know, you've slowly seen all of them kind of build up their... Um, build build up you know their their big their big lego mansion so to speak so really interesting to watch um how things are changing um and how they're uh taking over you know one city at a time as akon would say that's He's right such an asshole anyway hey, hey, so hey. <laughs> this is the, this is the tv and film segment of our podcast okay you know i can't stand akon <laughs> 
got nothing to do with Disney. You know I can't stand Akon, but yeah, I just I, I thought that was um... no. It's it's super interesting and it's very true. Soon it will be. I think at some point it would just be Disney. I don't know how legally they will be allowed to be a monopoly, but I mean they they are monopolizing all industries little by little. Yeah, they are. Um, they absolutely are. But I mean, listen, that's <laughs> that's capitalism for you. Yes, it is. Um. So yeah. Last but not least. Last but not least, we've got to end the episode with a movie review. Okay. You saw The Exorcist 2. It's called The Believer or something? It's actually not called oh, Number 2. Yeah. yeah. I did see it. Do you believe in life after all? Pretty sure that got, that wouldn't be the music for The Exorcist. Don't stop. Believe it. I don't think that would, I don't think that would be there either. But you know, if at first you don't succeed, dust yourself off and try again. Right. You could dust it off and try again, try again. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> Please do your review so I can stop. <laughs> you know. Uh, yeah. So I actually saw it by happenstance. I ended up having a ton of free time and being very close to my job and said, what the hell am I going to do four hours before my shift starts? I would be going home to basically come back an hour later. I'm going to just find something to do. And, you know, being that I have AMC A-list, I said, well, let me see what's playing in my theater by my job. Mm -hmm. And so that was starting in a few minutes and not really what I would have chose, but that's what worked time-wise. And so I strolled into the theater and caught it just as the trailers were ending and watched The Exorcist. Um, it was interesting. They gave nods to the original. Uh, the theme was definitely spot on. Uh, very interesting effects. Okay. Uh, there was a lot of religion in this film and spirituality, but that is expected that with something sense. like exorcist yeah uh but man they really dove into spirituality and religion towards the end of the film you know believing in a higher power and all of those things it was really interesting to see uh a horror movie that's also almost a religious or spiritual ad if you will um and there's a lot of other movies like that mm -hmm over the years, especially as of recent, I just don't really watch them because I'm not the biggest religious guy. And uh, so we all have seen clips or films where they have the exorcism ceremonies, especially in horror, religious horror movies, I guess we'll call them. There's a lot of that. There's all type of the exorcism of this person, the exorcism of that person, the exorcism of this area, the exorcism in that area. So you see some kind of clip or film where there's a religious ceremony happening to expel the spirit, blah, blah, blah. What was really interesting in this one, and I'm going way to the end of the movie, mm -hmm. uh, is this film acknowledges that every religion has that type of ceremony and, it, and every religion it acknowledges mm -hmm. that these type of events happen. And they all have different ways of expunging the spiritual infection of sorts. And they had a group session for this one. And it was really interesting to see how different uh, religious people kind of did different things. Yeah. And so that made it entertaining. Uh, I will say the film was entertaining. It had funny moments. Uh, it had really disrespectful moments. Um, I kind of want to see it. I don't know if you want to, and that's what I was about to get to. But overall, it wasn't a horror film. There weren't really any scary moments. Even if you have a high tolerance, I don't think, excuse me, even if you don't have a high tolerance, I think it was really scary. I think it was an entertaining thing to watch 
but it wasn't really scary. It was more, like I said, about the spiritual stuff. Uh, it was just a lot of religion on display. Uh, That's actually the part I'm curious about. The religious stuff? Well, then maybe you'll like yeah. it, but going into a horror movie, it's not really what I expected. Uh, I expect more horror. Um, I mean, I'm an asshole, so I was laughing at a lot of the disrespectful parts. Mm -hmm. That, to me, was more entertaining. Uh, but it wasn't a great film. It was maybe a six or a seven. It wasn't great. Um, yeah, I'm just, I'm just, I, I'm just curious how they, how that played out. I will say, if you are a person who has strong religious beliefs, mm -hmm. you probably should not watch this film. There are scenes in churches. There are scenes where they are disrespecting all of the religions. It might be hard for you to sit through that if you're not you. I'm saying listeners, viewers, whoever might have stumbled upon this review. Yeah, you probably don't want to see your religion being mocked right. or certain things that you may deem to be blasphemous happening on film. There is a very specific scene that's even in the trailer where one of the young ladies who has the spiritual infection, let's call it. Uh, or has been taken over by the demonic spirit, she's mocking Catholicism in the church as it's happening. And so they're doing like the body and the blood of Christ with the wafer and the wine. And she walks in and she's mocking it. And yeah, so that might be hard to watch if that's something you feel strongly I, I about. I understand that, yeah. I get that. Um, but there were some interesting plot twists that I won't spoil. Uh, <laughs> some of them are really fucked up and that was cool for me. Like, I really like that part. Like there's, yeah. there's one scene specifically when someone charges in and it's like, Oh, they're here to save the day and they die a horrible fucking death. And I thought that was super fly because it really came off. Like they were dash is coming in to save yeah. the day. Oh man, that, that character died a horrible death. Yeah. Yeah, and so I enjoyed that part. Okay. I enjoyed the the plot twists, and you know, as a person who's not spiritual, those things don't bother me. Mm -hmm. um, but I can see how someone who is religious would feel. Oh, these are very blasphemous events that are happening. Um, now I will say it was gory. That I didn't expect. Like there's a scene when I think it's a cross or a pair of scissors. I can't remember what they use, but. They straight up show somebody's eyes getting jammed out with a weapon. Um, I didn't expect it to be that gory. Uh, and then even during the exorcisms, there's like a lot of blood and different gory things happening uh, that I thought were interesting. Um, but I will say I didn't expect that stuff. Um, but it was all right. I mean, I wasn't I wasn't it. really overwhelmingly excited when I left. I just was like, all right, well, I needed to waste time. I wasted time. You wasted time. And enjoyed some popcorn. I mean, always always fun. Yeah. So overall, maybe a six and a half. Okay. If I gotta put a number to it, six and a half out of ten. Oh no, no, um, no, no, no. But don't say anything bad and anything bad. They Don't can, critique it. They can be mad if they want. Like, <laughs> make a better film if you want a better critique. Uh, agree. Agree. It actually, I I thought this was an interesting topic too because I was um, I was listening to a podcast or rather I saw an Instagram post about um, watching horror movies. You know, it was just Halloween. So um, I saw this post where um, it was by therapy for black girls and and she noted in the caption that there's an episode of the podcast that talks about horror films and using them um as a way to process trauma okay and i just thought that was really fascinating that's interesting i ended up looking for the episode and trying to find it because i was curious i don't really horror films are not the First thing I go to, or right. the second or the third, either. They're high on my list, or they used to be. <laughs> so Today, the, I like to say the horror movies of the two thousands have not been great. There are uh, there are people, people there are people who don't feel that way, but I think today films 
I think today horror films struggle with either the closing of the film or the overall writing of the film. I have not seen many films mm -hmm. which are good all throughout. Some films are scary, are entertaining. You're at the edge of your seat, but then the last 20, 30 minutes are absolute nonsense. And yeah. you, you are mad that you even saw the film. Or the opposite. Some films you're like, ah, oh, whatever. But then the ending is great. And you're like, man, why didn't they make the rest as good as the ending? By the time you get there, you're like exhausted. Yeah. Because you're like, I can't believe I sat through an hour and a half. They're usually not long. But it's like, why did I sit through all of this? Y'all could have did more of this. Yeah. I haven't found a lot of films to be good across the board. Like, I, I think you'd be hard pressed to find horror movies in the last 20 years or so that you would rank above a seven or eight. No, and I get that. I just thought it was, I thought it was interesting. I, I said, oh, and I, I looked for the episode and I found it and, and listened to it. And I don't know, I don't think I subscribe to <laughs> the idea that it's helpful to um, helping you process trauma. I think, Probably not. I think horror. I think horror films are meant to scare you. Even, whether they do or not is debatable. But I think they're meant to scare you. I think the argument was that you know you watch it and you see people come out on the other side, or you're you're able to, I guess, detach yourself from the emotion that gets attached to your traumas right so you're able to kind of see someone else go through adversity and either, i mean either they make it or they don't but then it's it's a layered conversation because then you have to talk about uh if you're talking about black people specifically you have to talk about their place in horror films and tra dying traditionally first. dying first traditionally they do not make it so Correct. that is that is a that's why i don't think it works um, but I think it's really interesting to use like pop culture as a, a way of um, therapizing people. I don't know. I thought it was interesting. I don't know. That, really that random. But um, no, it ties in. You talk, you talking about this made me made me think of that because um, I thought it was an interesting approach. I just don't know if I believe that. But yeah, I feel you. But I think it's super interesting. So that's my little two cents because I didn't see it, so I can't really say too much about the movie. But yeah. Um, I am curious about it. I'm always curious about things that uh, involve religion um, in a non-traditional way. There's a lot of horror so, movies that have done that in the last 20 years. Yeah. So and maybe maybe longer than that because the original Exorcist was super old. I mean, it makes sense. <clears throat> um, it absolutely makes sense. Uh, so that's, that's why I'm like, oh, I'm curious about it. I, I'm curious to see what that looks like. But yeah, that's... That's it. That is it. That's all we got. That's all we got. All right, y'all. Thank you for being here. Thank you for listening, watching, viewing, all of the above, one or the other. This is the Interpretive Dance Podcast. Thank you again. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> you see? You see? I'm so the sorry, patron, Usher. The patron saint of our podcast didn't like what you did. I'm so sorry, Usher. I can't wait to see you at the Super Bowl. Anyway. See y'all in two weeks. Bye.